This morning, if you uh, have your Bibles, I'm going to take just a few minutes and I'm going to ask you to join with me. In Romans, the, tw- the eighth chapter and verse 28, this morning about 3.30, 3.27 to be exact, I was praying, woke up this morning, the Lord kind of woke me up and nudged me early. I had my sermon all ready the night before, had things lined up and the Lord woke me up early this morning, I had some things run across my mind and the Lord began to run this thought through my mind because of all the things that are happening in the world today and things that are going on natural disasters seem to be going on on a regular basis temperature changes are are seeming to be a, a talk all the time and a lot of the things that we're seeing are happening shootings are going on on a regular basis you can't go anywhere where it's not talked about you can't go into almost seemingly any place where it doesn't seem to be evident We're seeing things happen in the world today that are are unbelievable. We're seeing circumstances that just amaze the thought and the mind, how that the the work of Satan is, is just completely working to turn the world upside down. But I can tell you this, that God is still in control, and God is still on his throne, and God has a plan, and his will will be done in this earth. And I want this morning to take just a few minutes to talk about it. What in the world is going on? What in the world is happening? Just take a few minutes, but I want you to look at the scripture. This is the scripture the Lord gave me about three o'clock this morning. And I began to, to, the thoughts begin to run through my mind. It says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. I've quoted that scripture many times at the bedside of those that are sick. And I've quoted it to myself many times and repeated it, read it out loud and said it to myself when I'm going through some difficult situations. Sometimes when, I, when it seems like the bottom has fallen out of my world and the bottom has fallen out of my life, struggles come my way. I begin to pursue the avenue of where can I go and where can I turn for help? As I was thinking this morning and I was reading early this morning, I went through and I I remembered some of the emails that I had read this week and some of the things that that had happened. And I wanted to show you this morning some of the pictures that that came in my mind. This is the first picture that that I had received from our international offices from the Hurricane Dorian um, disaster response. And these are some of the pictures of the isolated. This bottom one down here in the bottom uh, corner here is part of the church that was destroyed. Um, Sister um, Susan LaRosa has a few more pictures of, of another one of the churches that were destroyed. And if you'll look at that, the island is just devastated and, and they still can't figure out exactly how many people are lost and, and how many people have died. How many people's lives have been taken because of this tragedy. We don't know exactly why things like this happen. We don't exactly know, but part of it is, is God is in control and God has the proof and the evidence that these things will continue to happen and they will get worse and they will get stronger and they will become more evident. And the Bible tells us that, that as we go through this, now I'm going to ask you this, how can God take a flood and destroy the world and bring it and bring something good out of it? How can God take the loss of Job's family, his wealth and even his health and make something good of it? How can God take the cruelty of the cross and the death of his own son and save the world? I don't know how he will take, or I don't know how he will take your situation and make something good come from it, but he can and he will if you let him. Now, that bottom line, that last line, if you'll get this in your spirit, I don't know how God will take the adversity and the difficulty and the struggle that you are going through and he will turn it around and make something good out of it. How can God take the devastation of the hurricane and turn it for something that's good? How can God take a situation of tornadoes that touch down throughout the Carolinas and and devastated houses and parsonages? How can God turn those things around for good? How can God take the sicknesses and how God God can take the, the situations and the circumstances and how can he turn those around and bring something good out of it? How can God allow these things to happen? And somebody was telling me the other day, I heard an announcer say, And there was a sign that said, where is God in all of this? The problem with it is, is we've pushed God out and now we try to find him. The sad thing is, is God has never changed. We are the ones. 
who have allowed ourselves to change in the midst of the adversity and the difficulties. In pursuing our own passive natures, in pr- pursuing our own desires, we have let God go through it, and we have said, God, now, and, and all of a sudden we, bail, we want God to bail us out when we go through these problems and circumstances, and God is going to work them out for the good of those who are called according to His purpose. There's another part of it that says those who, if we go back to that first scripture that I, I brought up, Alejandro, if you will, and it says together, those who, who are called according to his purpose, but there's a verse right there that says together for the good of those who love God. Now, that's a pretty strong statement because there's a lot of people who want God, but they don't really love God. They want things from God. They want the love uh, of the things of God, but they don't really want to say that they love God. I mean, how can God take the circumstances that we face and the circumstances that we're dealing with? And I woke up this morning, and as I was praying, and began, God began to speak volumes to me, and, and sometimes I can't type fast enough. So if there's some mistypes, you just look over them. But as I was typing in and God began to feed this into my spirit, all I could think of was how can God take these tragedies and turn them into something good? How can God do that? Let's go back to our, our, the next slide one more time. Remember 9-11? How can God, how could God take the tragedies that happened on 9-11 and, and, and I, as we look at this, I mean, this is coming up this week. We're going to be remembering 9-11 and the disasters that took place. How can God take this destruction and all these things? And how can God bring something good out of that? How could anything good? There have been evident pictures. There have been stories told. There have been uh, provisions made. There have been stories told of how they found a, a, the devastation of an entire office and, and laying on top of a desk that was totally destroyed was a Bible open that God is my refuge and my, and my rock. Uh, There's many things that we can see, but I'm going to tell you something. God will bring something good out of it when you trust him in it. And no matter what your circumstance is, God is working to bring something good out of it. And as as I was praying over this thing, and I began to say, God... There are people that are hurting. There are people that are going through problems and they're going through struggles and, and, they're, and they're, they're, they're devastated. God, how can you bring something good out of that? How can you bring it out of the weaknesses of our, of our nature, out of the circumstances and the battles and the difficulties? God, how can you bring something good out of it? But he can. If we love him, and we are called according to his purpose. When I look at this, I begin to think about the nature of it. Go ahead and pull the next one up. Remember this, these slides, some of you may not even know about all this, but this was back when our church was broken into. They came in that back window right back there in that back corner. They broke in the, the day after New Year's. They broke in, they came in here, and they were a group of teenagers, and they decided that they wanted to destroy the sanctuary. They took the bass guitar, as you can see it all smashed up right there, and they took it and they broke the chandeliers And many of these chandeliers have been, most of them have been replaced and fixed. Some of them we had some extra ones, but we we fixed those. But they smashed them. They took the pews and they took the guitar and they began to beat it. They had the chairs that were in the back, along the back wall. We had some pretty purple chairs and green pews. And they threw them all across the front and they tore the pews up. They destroyed it. And they left it looking this way. Daryl, you look good in that picture right there, by the way, running that broom. Pews were broken, seats were tore up, they tried to break all the pews, they couldn't get them all up because they had bolts about that long in the floor, and, but they just did their best to destroy. And, and, and how could God bring something good out of that? And, and I, 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 I was sitting there, and I remember uh, the, 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 the pulling up the, the pews, and I remember trying to fix the bass guitar and I remember how that we've had uh, these things and I can tell you this that that when I looked at that and we walked into this place I was devastated how could somebody do such a thing but out of that destruction God brought something good out of it God brought something I mean look at the seats you're sitting on we got new carpet in the floor now these are padded seats and they're very thick. Some of you are very comfortable. I can tell by the way your eyes are shutting back and forth. But 
These are very, they're very nice. We got the extra wide ones for those who need them. Amen. Just moving on. But I thank God. Go ahead and pull that next one up. That's what we have blessed with now. We got a new pulpit. The old one's still back there. It's busted out. They kicked in the side. They tore it up. And I walk through this building, and sometimes I look at the devastation. I go back and look at those pictures. I go back and look at those things. And I can tell you this, that right now God is still God. Even when we walked in on that New Year's Day, and we walked in, and there was such destruction, God is still God. And he does not change. I began to look at the idea of this and all the things that had happened and everything that, that we would have been easy to say. This is too much to bear. It's too hard to get through. It's too hard to understand. And I can tell you this. You will never totally understand destruction or devastation. You will never truly understand the sickness or the battles that you go through. Many times, even on the other side of this, after God brings you through a storm, you will still not understand completely why you went through it. You will not understand completely why. I can't tell you why three teenagers thought it was such a big deal to come into a church and destroy it. I, I don't know why uh, that, that we see those things. That, 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 that's, that's just one. I don't understand why somebody hated somebody so much and hated the, 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 this country that we live in, hated it so much that they would fly an airplane in and kill innocent people just because of the hatred that was there. I don't understand all the natural disasters and the way that the storm came through. I don't understand why innocent people were killed, why godly people were killed, but I can tell you this, if we trust God, God will bring something good out of every circumstance because that's what his word says in Romans 8 and 28. Because I can tell you this, that family's home that was destroyed in the Bahamas when the storm came through, I can tell you this right now, they're not mourning over this earth. They're celebrating in heaven today. Amen. And they went on to be with God. And God is going to rebuild and God is going to do something great because on top of the destruction and on top of the disasters, God brings something good out of it. Out of the circumstances and situations that this world is in right now. God is going to bring something good out of it. God can bring something good out of almost any situation. Go ahead and pull that next one up. The Bible tells us in, Gen in Genesis, one of my favorite sections of Scripture is Genesis, the last chapter of Joseph's life. Joseph, the 50th, uh, the 50th chapter of Genesis, Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for I am in the place of God. But as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people. And now therefore do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. And he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. The scripture that jumped out at me, Brother Far, it's as if God spoke it audibly to me. And he said, I'm going to do this to save many people. I believe without a shadow of a doubt, everything that's going on in this world is so God can save people. God is using the battles and the circumstances and the struggles that his believers are going through. And God will use you in situations so that something good can come out of it. Something good. It can wake up a family. It can turn a life around. It can turn your neighborhood upside down. It can turn a school upside down. It can change the job application. When you get a hold of God and you realize and you love God and you are called according to His purpose to be right where you are, God can bring something good out of it. Just before I go on any further, I want you just to bow your heads right now. I want you to think about it right now. You know the circumstances that you're in right now. You know your battle. It may be physical, spiritual, emotional. It may be at your job. It may be in your family right now. Your family may be totally devastated with the work of the enemy. But God wants to bring something good out of it. It may be your health right now. You may not even hardly be able to stand being here right now, but I believe without a shadow of a doubt God can bring something good out of that. 
with your heads bowed right now, wherever you find yourself, know this, that God is working out something good in that circumstance that you're in. And I'm not telling you it's good that you go through a storm. I'm not telling you it's good that you're in the midst of adversity. I'm not telling you this. God has a purpose and a plan for you. He knew you from your mother's womb, and God has a plan for you. And what you need to realize is God wants to use where you are and what you're going through for his glory. And God wants you to quit complaining about it. And God wants you to rejoice because you have been found worthy to minister for him. His purpose is being fulfilled in your life. I want you just to lift your hand up right now. If you're going through a situation, I just want you to begin to say, Lord, you know what you're doing, and I trust you in it. Let this bring glory for you. Let this bring something good. Bring something good out of it to my children and my grandchildren. Bring something good out of it, God to touch my boss, to touch my fellow workers. God, bring something good out of this. Bring something good out of the circumstance that I find myself in. Out of this sickness, God, reach this place where I am. God, I I ask you today, forgive me of complaining. And God, use this circumstance for your glory. God, I ask it today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. You keep that thought this morning for just the next few minutes. I want to look at this. Matthew, the 24th chapter. As I began to read and began to study, the Lord just kept feeding me. And this is some things that that I had had earlier in the week and I'd prepared. But Matthew, the 24th chapter, Jesus gives his Olivet Report and begins to talk about the end times. And many times we think of this passage of Scripture only to the Jews. But I believe that God is speaking to us today in the world as much as he is just to the Jewish nation. And he sat on the Mount of Olives and the disciples, and he came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and and of the end of the age? And we have oftentimes just used this to talk about the end times instead of the adversity that we face every day. Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And, and then he will, will be offended and, and will be, Oh, I think you missed one. Yes, and you will hear uh, of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for, the, for all these things must come to pass. Did you see that? All these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. Anybody been to California lately? And all these things are the beginning of sorrows. And then they will deliver you up, the tribulation, and kill you. And and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many uh, will be offended and and betray one another and, and will hate one another. And then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound and the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as the witness to all nations. And then the end will come. The things that are happening in the world today have to happen to prepare for God's return. And because we're in this world, we're a part of it. And because we're in this world, we're going to see those disasters around us. I know Christians that have missed and been averted by the worst of circumstances. I know on on 9-11 there were those who were believers that were miraculously delivered. But I also know believers who were Christians that went that day and prayed. And they gathered and and, and prayed before they even went to their offices. And I know that. And then they were were killed. But the thing that I can tell you is this. The end of their life didn't stop that day. It lived on in the hope. Uh, Amen. Let me tell you this. If I love God, the end of this life is only the beginning. Amen. It's just began. Amen. Uh, The the best thing that can happen to the believer is that your life can be taken on this earth. Amen. I'm a pilgrim passing through. I'm not looking to stay here forever. Amen. 
I'm not looking for this to be my permanent home. I have residency in another place that Jesus is preparing for me that one day I will be with him. And no matter what this detail of this world may be, no matter what circumstances may be, as long as I'm here, I will pursue and preach and do the purpose that God has for me. But one thing I'm doing, uh, Brother Padilla, I'm looking forward to heaven. Amen. I'm looking forward to running with Garrett down streets of gold. I'm looking for the opportunity when this old knee won't hurt no more. I'm looking for a day when, Don, you won't need that old pacemaker. I'm going to tell you something. When I get to heaven, I'm going to be celebrating. And so all these things must take place for the end to come. This world will get worse. The Bible tells us in different places about how the destruction and the, ra the ravaging of pe pestilence is going to get worse. The storms and diseases and things. I mean, they're coming up with new diseases now. Amen. Over 400 cases right now of people using the, what do you call it? Vapor thing, vape things. I don't even know what they are, but. We find new ways to destroy this that God has given us. Pornography is at, at, at its largest point right now in the, in the world. Pornography is bigger than it's ever been and growing daily. Homes are being ravaged and torn apart. Places, listen, we're, we're seeing things bounce back and forth, and I'm not telling you anything you don't know, and I'm not preaching a gloom and doom message today, but I'm going to tell you something. If you're going to live in a world that's falling apart, you better hold on to Jesus Christ. Amen. You better know him. You better not leave this place this morning without being assured that your heart is set in heaven. Amen. That you're living according to his purpose and his plan for your life. We don't know what this world can have. I, I thank the Lord. I know people are moving daily to, to Arizona because we don't have a lot of the natural disasters. Amen. I mean, hey, you can't shovel sunshine. Amen. I, 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 you, you, you think that's, that's kind of funny, but I can remember. I can tell you this. I remember a day when, when we had to go to the funeral of a young man that's my age, Dave. He's a young fella. But he was out shoveling snow in his driveway, came in from shoveling snow, told his wife, he said, I'm really tired. I'll go in and sit down. About a half hour later, his wife went in to check on him, and he was dead, had a massive heart attack and died. Tell me shoveling snow won't kill you. I'm telling you, it will. I can remember tornadoes that used to come through in Indiana. I remember sitting in a car one time, and the tornado picked the car up and turned it around, set it right in the middle of the highway. I can remember it mangling a, a, a swing set in our, in our backyard where it looked like somebody had just taken that, that and just smashed it with their hands and wadded it up and threw it in a big ball, wadded up. I, I thank the Lord. And, and I, I'm thinking, Lord, there's, well, we're in the safest place in the world. We're in Arizona. And then all of a sudden, I oh, thank you, Jamie. I can tell you this. We're in the middle of a, a, a fault line that could happen at any moment. Things can happen here just like it could any place else. And the destructive wand can be, be brought about. One of the things that I am, I'm telling you, and I'm not, again, I'm not trying to create fear in you. I'm trying to create the opportunity for you to be ready. And 30 people go out on a, on a cruise and, and they're going to be doing some deep sea diving that they've done for several years and, and they've done it before and they, they, and they enjoy the time and all of a sudden they're caught in the bottom of a boat and it catches on fire and they're all killed? When somebody goes into a Walmart, and how many of you go into Walmart regularly? My mother-in-law ought to be waving both hands. She's got her own parking place. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> when you walk into Walmart, you go to a movie theater, somebody starts shooting. You go, go any place, you go to a ball game now, and then they, they've got to scan you and make sure that, that you're not coming in to try to kill somebody. Go to a, a high school football game, and somebody brings a semi-automatic gun and starts shooting. 
what is happening? What in the world is happening? What's going on? When, when we live in a world that's now, that is exactly what Matthew, the 24th chapter, tells us. These things must happen, and then the end will come. And you don't have to walk in fear. I'm going to tell you something. My, my son Joe, when he started driving, all I could think of, I remembered when Brandon started driving and how I prayed every day when he'd leave the house, oh God, keep him, keep him safe. Now he lives far enough away, I, I pray for him at night before I go to bed. But when Joe leaves the house, the enemy puts in my mind, that may be the last time you see him. He, he's driving down a, a road where people drive so fast, everybody's in a hurry. In this world that we live in, everybody's in a, in a hurry. They're running to and fro, and they, and they take very little care of and concern of life. And it wakes me up, and, it, and I, I, I'm concerned about it. But I will not let the enemy create fear in me, because I can tell you this. My hope is not in this world. My hope is not in my future. My hope is in Jesus Christ. He's the author and finisher of my life. Go ahead and pull that next one up. First, there is coming a day the earth will be destroyed. We're not going to, we're not going to get by with this. It's not going to, this earth will be destroyed. Look at the scriptures that go along with it. The heaven and earth will pass away. Go ahead and pull the next one up. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more. So if you're planning on this being your home forever and you are putting stockpile in this place, it's going to be consumed with fire. Now, I'm telling you, you don't have to, I'm not telling you, you can't be comfortable. I'm not telling you it's wrong to have things on this earth. But if that's what you're living for, you are going to be sadly mistaken. Amen. My, my kids are always talking to me. They said, Dad, you got you to gotta save some of these things because we, well, we're going to inherit it one day. You don't want to spend our inheritance. I said, I have God plans for you. When, when I go on to heaven, I am leaving you a stack of bills that you will live forever. <laughs> and I have all of that plan. But if you're living for this earth, it will be, pass away. It will not be here forever. Go ahead and pull the next one up. I'm trying to hurry. Stay with me. Second, we do not know when the end will be. The Bible clearly states to that. It says, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, but my Father only. Now the promise is, is this. I can tell you that there is an end coming, but I cannot tell you when it will be. I know the signs that are beginning to line up and they're becoming greater and greater. I can tell you that we're beginning to see more and more evidence of it in so many fashions, in so many ways. But listen, I'm going to tell you this. You, you may be looking for the end, but your day may come today. This may be the minute that you breathe your last breath. And the time that we have on this earth is to prepare for what we'll do for eternity. Why wouldn't God tell us that he's coming and what day he's coming? Because listen, I can tell you exactly why. Many of you are sitting here this morning with this very thought in your mind. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Wouldn't it be nice? How many of you have ever had your house broken into, car broken into? You've ever had a some of you know my parents' house was broken into. I've, I've, I've had that happen in my house, my wife. Not too long ago, but anyways, when, wouldn't it be nice if they sent you a little card and said, hey, listen, uh, about 10 o'clock, we're coming by, we're going to steal everything you've got, just wanted to let you know, so you could be ready, just put the good stuff out so we don't have to tear up everything, just go ahead and pile it out there. And we'll do, listen, that, that's exactly, you know why Jesus, you know why God did not and the Father did not tell us when he's coming back is because many of us procrastinate our commitment to Christ and, and, and we're not committing to him like we could live forever and never die. And many of us have the future in our minds and all we're thinking about is I'll commit to Christ when that time is right. 
I'll commit my life when I have time to deal with it instead of thinking about it today because this could be the day. This could be the moment. This could be the very hour that you take your last breath. I've been beside many. I've stood beside the bedside of those who take their last breath. And some of you that have, have had family members and friends, I, I've saw them. I've seen that. I've held the hand of those who, who, who look up. And, and, and those that are ready to go, when they look up, you can hold their hand and you're gleaming. They're looking forward to the streets of gold. They're looking for hope. But I've held the hand of sinners, Brother Bledsoe, that are not ready to go. And fear is in their hearts. Fear is in their eyes. You can see it on their face. They're afraid because they don't know what your fu their future holds. But I'm going to tell you something when you know Jesus Christ the enemy may try to tell you that you're not ready but believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved amen you don't have to be afraid of what the future holds you can put your trust in Jesus Christ and he will get the good out of your life something good is about to happen you remember that old expectation song something good and every time that the natural disasters happen I, I, I pray and I begin to pray and I say, oh God, don't let this destructive nature hurt innocent people. But God, bring something good out of this. Bring something good out of it. People can look at it and say, well, I'm going to blame God because God could have stopped that storm. God could have stopped this. God could have stopped. Yes. But God also gave us an opportunity 2,000 years ago with the Son, Jesus Christ, to prepare us for everything that we'll ever face. I don't know what tomorrow brings, but he does. He holds our tomorrows in his hand. He knows what's going on. There may be a reason why the Lord had you come in this church today. It's because you're trying to battle and worry about your circumstances instead of trusting God for your future. Instead of believing God in the midst of your adversity and your difficulty to trust him in it. God can bring something good out of it when you don't see it. God can bring something good out of it even when you don't understand it. And he said, take heed that you be not deceived, for many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and, and the time has drawn near. Therefore, do not go after them. He says, but, then, but when you hear of wars and, and commotions, do not be terrified, for these things must come to pass. But the end will come and immediately. Go ahead. Look what it says in Luke, the, seventh, the, the 21st chapter, in verse 13. But it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Everything that is happening in the world is for us to take opportunity to share the love of Christ and lead others to Christ. I told you last week, that was my text. The testimony of our life was for the opportunity that God has for us to be a witness in these last days. Do you know that why God hasn't taken his church home? I can tell you one of the reasons is because it's a whole lot of people that are not ready to go. There is a whole lot of people that aren't prepared. There's a whole lot of people that need to know Jesus Christ. And God may allow us to be here and to lead them and to love them, to guide them at moments of weakness, to share the love of Christ. I can tell you this, it ought to scare us to death if you're not ready for Christ. It ought to scare you to death when you see something like that on a screen. It ought to scare you to death when you see the devastation of the Bahamas. It ought to scare you to death when you see a, a guns shooting it ought to scare you to death to go anywhere. But I can tell you this. You can walk out of this place wiping away every fear that you'll ever have. Knowing this. That God will provide a way for you. God will take care of your tomorrows. And he will bring a testimony out of it that will touch others. I want you to stand with me all across this place. Not quite 17 minutes, Brother Bledsoe. But I do know this, that God is able. God is able. Listen, 
The enemy would like to tell you, you're never going to make it. You're never going to make it. The enemy would like to tell you that the world is falling apart. And there's no hope. But I can tell you in Jesus Christ, there's always hope. I can tell you this, that if you're not ready, you need to get ready. For two reasons. Number one is there is a promised end to come. This world as we know it, this life as we know it, will come to an end one day. The second thing is, is that we live in a world where craziness seems to be the normal. Sickness seems to be on a new edge every day. Diseases come up every time you turn around that they've never even heard of. It becomes more prevalent. Opens our eyes to think how vulnerable we are. But then I remember. I remember how big my God is. I remember how big He is. Right now. Right now. I, I want to just do this to bow your heads. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around. I didn't have a lot of time to do a lot of other things other than this right now. If you're not sure where you are with Jesus Christ, you're not sure where you are in your relationship with Him right now. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around right now, I pray that you would just commit your life. That word when it says they love God, it was that they had chosen God for their Savior. That, that, that work that we say, we take it so easily that we are saved. And what that means is simply I am, I am bound for hell in this fleshly body. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. This morning, right now, if you're not sure where you are in your relationship with Him, if you've never committed your life to Christ, or perhaps you've played games with Him, there's a reason why God had me preach this message today. Some of you are going through some of the most devastating things that you've ever been through in your life. You're going through circumstances that you can't bear in your own. And you're wondering, God, why did you allow this? Why is it happening? And God wants to bring something good out of it. God wants to bring something good out of that situation. God's going to bring something good out of it. You can't lose your love for Christ and you can't allow the work of the enemy to lie to you and let you think that God loves you. God doesn't love you, but God loves you so much that He chose you and He used you. Just like He did Job, He's using you to touch the lives of others. Right now, God, speak to this. With your heads bowed right now, I pray right now, Heavenly Father, that every heart would be open to hear. Every mind would be ready to receive. And every life be surrendered to you. But God, I can't do that, and you won't make it happen. We've got to willingly lay down our life so that we can take it up, so that we can follow you. We've got to believe in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We've got to believe in a Savior who came to die for us right now, Heavenly Father. There are those under the sound of my voice that, that I don't believe right now. And I, God, you, you spoke to my heart this morning. There are those in this congregation that will stand here today that are not sure where they are in their relationship with you. And God, I pray right now with their heads bowed and eyes closed right now. They would search deep within their heart and they would commit their life to you. I want to pray this prayer and then I'm going to pray over the needs right now. But I want to pray this prayer right now to those who are under the sound of my voice. If you're not sure right now, I want you to repeat this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I commit my life to you. Take these battles, take these burdens, I give them to you. I surrender my life. And I accept your son, Jesus Christ, as my Lord and Savior. Forgive me of my sin and the things that I have done. And right now, let me be assured of my home in heaven.
thank you for loving me, God. Even when I didn't love myself, you loved me, God. And now I return that. And I love you with all that's within me. I love you. Now this morning, I feel that I want to do this this morning. If you're struggling with God bringing something good out of your situation right now, very quickly, very quickly, you're going through something right now and you're just saying, God, how, how's it going to work? What are you going to do? I just want you to lift your hands up. Be honest. God, how are you going to make this work? How are you going to make this work? There's some that I see. Some of you are raising your hands. Some of you are struggling with it. Right now, God, you want something good to come out of it. Hold them up high. Hold them up high. Don't, don't, be, a, don't be shy right now. God is about to do something. I want my prayer partners to move from out of your seats right now. They're going to put their hands on you, and I'm going to join with them. We're going to do our best to pray for as many needs right now as we can. We're going to go throughout this congregation. We're going to pray. And as they sing and they play right now, I want the power of God to fall fresh on this place.